Let's go directly to the second panel, from fascination to construction. After decades of fascination by technology, its ubiquity has become a global instrument of progress, but also a tool of oppression and segregation. Many young practices try to develop certain sensitivities to expand the concept of technology beyond the heroic construction system, exploring its cultural and social implications to understand and to re-describe complex social and cultural contexts. We have, again, three practices invited to this panel. Amund will be first. From 2010, Sonia Nagel and Jan Thiessen have been working in Berlin under the name of Amund in cooperation with Björn Martensen. The material and architectural culture is intimately connected with the construction understood as an statement. In their work, small commissions are used as a laboratory of construction inventions, and because many of them are interventions in existing architectures, their engagement with reducing, reusing, and recycling buildings is part of the ideology of the office. O plus H architects are Maki Onishi and Yuki Hyakuda, and they are established in Tokyo in 2008. Materiality and construction are in the base of their work. Simplicity and a kind of do-it-yourself amateurism builds a precise example of how to work with the immediate resources in a very inventive way. Palace, Benjamin Reynolds and Baya Medina established Palace in Basel in 2012. Their web page is organized in cycles, botanics, materials, and displays as a collection of windows that shows how they speculate and react to different states of culture, space, and economy. The moderator of this panel will be Lori Hawkinson. Lori Hawkinson is professor of architecture at Columbia GSAP and is also partner of Smith, Miller, and Hawkinson Architects, an office with a long trajectory as a laboratory of speculation and making, uh, an office also for investigation and practice, negotiating traditional craft with vanguard construction techniques. So let me invite Amund on the stage. Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for inviting us to Colombia. I'm very happy that we are around here in this conference. So. And um, I want to, uh, also I'm Sonia, I also, also want to say hello. And it's really amazing to see how somehow is perhaps a generation that forms a they have some common ground, and I'm, I'm recognizing that, that uh, the dealing with problems is per perhaps something which uh, everybody of us is dealing with a lot. And this is very interesting to me. So we are two-thirds of the office Amund, um, Sonia, me, and Björn. Um, Amund is actually the acronym of our names, so it's Architects um, Martinson and Nagel Tyson. And um, so we um, we founded by kind of random. Uh, the office was founded almost randomly, and I will give you a short introduction about our history. So. This is the Academy of Arts where we studied architecture. Um, I studied industrial design before uh, at the Design Academy and at the Academy in Saarbrücken in Germany. And then at the Academy, Sonja and me, we met. And there it was also my, like Mareike uh, did say, uh, it was very, the, in the design studios, it was very focused on the conceptual way and of bold designs and how to um, focus on a very bold and um, architecture. And there um, I did an internship and at the inter I did the internship at the office of BNK Plus which is the first office of Arno Brandelhuber in Cologne. Um, Björn Martinson was a partner there at that time, and that's where we met. And we both finished our studies with a diploma in 2002 and three. And at that time, it was already um, a little crisis in Germany, so many of our colleagues went to Spain and to countries where it went well at that time. 
So we stayed in Germany and we mainly did um, exhibition designs in the first years. So this was our first project. It's a very small exhibition. We did for an off for a design competition where um, office products had to be dis um, presented. So we made an abstract um, office context um, with, an off with a vacuum molded tabletop um, where we presented the new designs. So it looked like this. Um, we had all these red tables with this vacuum molded surface where we presented the new developed um, products for this design competition. Um, then we did an exhibition on some urban planning and some architecture uh, in the city of Mannheim. They had this 400 years anniversary that they were celebrating and we were asked to do an um, exhibition in a museum there. And then we also did some fair stands. This is for example for a solar module company um, producer. And we did this uh, fair stand where we um, did hang the solar modules from the ceiling, and they um, and on the reflecting floor you could um, see the the mirrored image of this um, hanging city, or and you could walk above this roofs of this solar um, solar covered solar module covered roofs. So. so during these uh, first years, we um, hardly could get any um, architectural permission. And so we, um, but we are, were still all the time very enthusiastic about architecture. And uh, we're very interested. And so we, we are some small studies, studies we could um, go on with architectural or dealing with architectural themes and topics and which we are kind of interested. It was more like a hobby in these time days. And um, a few and a few years ago we um, our passion for observation uh, found um, for architecture without architects and also with uh, for anonymous, anonymous architecture led us to a special phenomenon which we have uh, documented ever since. And um, this card shows a little bit the periphery of Stuttgart. It's very fragmented, a lot of um, settlements going on. It's very dense, the whole region. And um, the, the initial ignition was a bizarre building which we found in this region. It was an elevated gas station and residential building, a mixed use building. And it was planned like this. It was not rebuilt somehow. This was the original planning from an architect. And we discovered this building in, a, in the urban periphery around Stuttgart, which is characterized by many medium-sized companies. And these buildings are special to us because they, are, they, 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 ex they come to existence through a special law regulation. And um, these are kind of mixture buildings, and uh, they are especially you can especially find these buildings in in industrial areas. And in these, the the, the possibility in this area is um, that the rigid separation of function is softened up by the legislator, and uh, the the people who are living there or the entrepreneurs they are interpreting this uh, situation in different, <laughs> very kind of interesting and funny ways. So we, um, this was kind of the study we did by our own. And it's, um, why, why are we interested in these buildings, um, in, in these mixed buildings? In this, it's kind of a symbiosis. And um, on the one hand, they are kind of unconventional to us because there is some, very often there is no architect uh, in, uh, inter, um, integrated in this design process. And so they have also a high degree of individual solutions. And uh, on the other hand, 
these buildings also overcome the functional separation of modernity and creates a center of life that integrates work and home at the same place. And um, the inhabitants of these areas, um, they are a little bit unnoticed and um, they ex make kind of experiments with uh, possible, possible forms of buildings uh, that, um, and also with life on, and also models of working somehow, and that's what we are interested in. And uh, in this early study, uh, there's also, you can see kind of an obsession or passion for, for kind of a field research, for observations of the built environment, and um, also for the examination of the context, why can these uh, forms or designs or buildings occur? Probably there are some role models for us, like Rudowski's Architecture Without Architects, and also the investigations of Ellison and Peter Smith and Venturi Scott Brown, and also the photographs of Bernd and Hilla Becher, which are encouraging us to, or encourage us to kind of follow our passion. And because at the beginning when we did that, uh, a lot of other architects we asked, uh, we showed them our photos and we were kind of proud and somehow uh, f um, fascinated about that and they could not really understand what we are doing. And but so, we, but we keep on doing that <laughs> and uh, photograph these uh, things. And because they, um, also find some, uh, they, for us we can find some solution in these, um, in these photographs and these strange, kind of strange uh, buildings. So. so this is one of, um, the fascination is, or there's a really wide range of things that we are fascinated with. So it's um, like everyday buildings, but also like this are very traditional buildings that um, have a strange, uh, shape which is a result of circumstances, streets, neighbors. Um, so we, we collect this and the buildings of the in-between cities with these um, half industrial, half living um, buildings, that's a bigger body of um, photographs which we are, which we collected and we could form a group of. So. In 2009, um, we did our first joint project, um, Bjorn, Sonia, and me, which is the Just K house. Um, it's a low energy or passive house um, for a family with four kids. And um, we had lots of constraints and requirements for this building. It was a very small site with 365 square meters. and. It was a house for a family of four, uh, of no, of five, and now six. So um, it has to had to be a more tower-like building, and for there are all these constraints and requirements. There are some buildings like the Black Maria, which is a quite important building for us. Um, it's a, one of the first film studios. Um, for the Edison Film Company uh, from 1890 um, or the 90s. And it was um, a building to develop uh, films. And at that time, the film material um, was not very light sensitive. So they had to invent this, uh, this film studio where which you could rotate and open the roof. So you could expose the... Um, the film material to m the maximum of light. And um, so this kind of buildings, we are, or this kind of, I of ideas, we, we try to um, incorporate in the design of the Just K house. Um, here you see the development in, in models. We work quite a lot with models, but also with Rhino and with 3D. But which you never show because it's not sexy for... Um, um, so... And another requirement was the local building regulations. 
So we had to build a pitched roof in the area. Um, usually you don't build pitched roofs in during architecture school or you are, um, it starts now, but in our studies um, it was not that popular. And we got kind of fascinated by the diversity and um, of pitched roofs there were. And so these are some targets and solutions we found for this house. The, the elevated um, ground floor, which is the main living space, and then the bedrooms and the individual rooms under this huge roof space. And in the interior is all done in a prefabricated massive wood panels, which um, we investigated a lot at that time, uh, how to work with this system. Uh, another aspect um, was the, that we are very inspired by artists which work with minimum spaces like Alan Wexler from New York. And I happened to work with him in 1999 when I was studying here uh, in New York. And um, some of the ideas we incorporated in also the Just K House, the, how to build minimum space for five to six people and still generating a feeling of generosity in this building. Or then there are these cellules of, the, uh, of Absalon. It's an artist, he already died uh, from Israel, and he created this very intimate cellule um, just around the daily functions of the uh, inhabitants that are imagined inhabitants. So I will focus a little bit more on, on technical aspect um, of this project of the Just K House. We had a very limited budget, so we decided um, to cover the roof in a very cheap um, roofing material. It's a roofing membrane, which is usually used um, for industrial or for warehouses. And um, it was a very technical and simple solution how to seal the horizontal seams, but there was no solution for the edges. Um, and another inspiration is like the Belgian fashion designer Marta Magella. And in the 80s, he deconstructed f fashion or garments. And he, he took them apart and restitched them again, putting the seam to the outside so that um, the production process of fashion and of, gar um, of furniture, uh, not furniture, uh, of, of clothes became visible. So on the right side, um, you see the corner detail as it was proposed by the by the company, and on the left side, you see the detail how we finally did it, and to accentuate the corners of this building, and uh, to give it also a more distinct um, appearance. So, as I mentioned, we deal, deal a lot with the found, found crude architecture of everyday life. And um, we like this unpretentious charm of these buildings. And also, it's not always about beauty, beauty in these buildings, but uh, they are rich in a kind of stimulating insp inspirations and unusual design tricks. And that testifies somehow a relaxed um, approach uh, to handle materials or finding solutions. And uh, through these daily observations, we, uh, we, we find uh, interesting solutions and strategies um, of which we can learn. And we photograph these buildings um, and try to um, understand the circumstances and these strategies. We found it could be the use of material or also um, detailed solutions, or we want to kind of uh, enlarge our repertoire to find solution to our design problems. Uh, for example, this illustrated by a um, project we did um, some years ago, and, and our client, he bought a quite, um, quite ordinary house, and uh, he wanted to, ex we had to extend that. 
and um, we wanted to do it in a simple way. And there are some kind of uh, our, of our findings how they build and how they extend and how they deal um, uh, materials that they already have, like, like this house in Bilgatzwiesen, and. Um, they, there we are kind of somehow attracted by the, this radical uh, pragmatism and also the kind of, it also shows somehow a kind of how uh, um, anonymous buildings are grown somehow and, um, and, and with these uh, things they are crea creating very often a very own specific character which we are interested in. And also, for example, these ruins in, in, in we've we'd found in our holiday in Greece, um, which also remind a little bit on the work of uh, art of the artist Solivit, and this also could be an inspiration for our design solutions. And actually, we are interested in quite a lot of a wide range of building activities, and. Um, so the, this is the existing building which the client bought. It's quite a, uh, not really, it's a very, very simple structure. And um, nevertheless, we think that also these kind of very um, p simple um, buildings are, have the potential to, um, to, to develop a lot of qualities. And um, so, in this, budget, in this project, it was a lot about um, sustainability and resi resi resilience, and um, also we wanted to in, we wanted to make a kind of a concept out of repairing things instead of building or rebuilding things, and so um, we wherever we, it was possible, we tried to apply this re re method of of uh, repairing to our project. Also, we we um, con and, and we also wanted to overcome the separation of the old and the new. We just want to go on building as we uh, with, as we saw it a lot in uh, old uh, medieval towns, for example. And so um, this was the extension for the family uh, to extend the six, 70 square meters building to uh, for a family and the use of the on the needs to a family of five now. And, um, and also bring some very light and uh, modern life uh, or in this uh, building. So for us, architecture has a lot to do with also interventions. Or, and many of these interventions are somehow already done in the past hundreds and maybe also thousands of years um, that architecture is, exists. And for us, it's very quite important to know um, these strategies and to, um, and to how to deal with them. So I already saw that time is over. So I quickly s flip through the final project, which is the Freed Pavilion. Um, it's a cafe pavilion on a cemetery in the city of Duren and they had um, the requirement was that it a public cemetery uh, it's a public cemetery the requirement was that there is a cafe pavilion for morning feasts but as well as regular visitors so um, we had the idea um, to combine these archaic shapes with a, with a kind of modern pavilion-like um, idea. And it's this square ground floor, 12 by 12 meters roughly, roughly, and it's organized by, four, uh, by three volumes, um, the bathrooms and the kitchen. Uh, and you have three guest rooms, so you could use these guest rooms individually um, for smaller groups or uh, join two of the guest rooms for bigger groups. And in section, um, it shows the diversity of these three spaces. So you have a vaulted space, a tent roof space, and a, um, and a pitched roof space. And all these spaces open up to the surrounding cemetery and park, and um, creating a distinct um, facade towards um, the surrounding 
cemetery. Um, at daytime, it has this reflective glaze, um, and at nighttime, it changes and the pavilion becomes transparent. And so, Amund is, as I said before, a, a collaboration of Bjorn Martinson, Sonja Nagel, and me. We are actually two independent offices uh, working together um, for projects, but also with other offices. So this is part of Björn Martinson's office, um, a small working space um, for his um, models and um, the computer opening to the adjacent garden. Um, that's an archive and archive space in our studio, um, which is also in a regular um, townhouse in the city of Stuttgart. Um, well, that's a uh, friend of us visiting us, a um, friend of Par from Paris visiting us in our office. So, um, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are O plus H. Uh, my name is Maki Onishi. Uh, I'm Yuki Hyakuda. Thank you very much for inviting us to this symposium. Um, we started our office uh, in 2008, uh, right after we finished a uh, master course. We are actually uh, classmates in Kyoto University. And um, Yuki uh, decided to go to Toyo Ito's office for five years. And I stayed in Tokyo University as a doctor course student, and also I was teaching in YGSA, Yokohama National University, where uh, Kazuyo Sejima and Ryue Nishizawa are also teaching. And um, we, uh, in, in 2011, in Japan, we had a big earthquake in Tohoku area, earthquake and tsunami, and that was a big thing for us when we start, started architecture. Um, this is our office. Um, let us introduce our office. Our office is in Nihonbashi area, Tokyo. And our last office was actually in the, on the fifth floor in a building. But um, we decided to move here after 2011 earthquake because um, we found it is very interesting to talk local people and think architecture together. So we moved our office on the ground floor and totally open to the town, like this. It's almost <laughs> like a vegetable shop. We has, uh, actually it was a garage, so we don't have any glass, glasses, glass. <laughs> so totally open to, to the town. So sometimes uh, many <laughs> children suddenly come to our office uh, to see our models. And we use Rose as a room to make big mock-ups like this. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Hi. Um, it's OK. Hi. <laughs> In the um, 20th century, people tend to think that it is important to look for a common rule that can be shared by as many as people as possible. In our current time, small individualities like ripples enabling us to re respect the things that one can, one can and cannot do, while overlapping of diversity values, we can also cherish what we share. Um, one of the beginnings that led us to respect individualities and diversity is a project called Good Job Center Kashiba. It is a place where people with disabilities create new jobs in society. Um, it is the message from the client when we were asked to design Good Job Center Kashiba. Um, 
sorry, my English is bad, but I would <laughs> like to read this um, concept. Acknowledge the differences, cherish the differences. To distinguish the dis differences between each person, cherish these differences and aim to create an environment where good distinction can grow. It is necessary to properly understand the characteristics of human in order to create a com comfortable living environment based on such understanding. Art illustrates the differences between each person pro profoundly, allow allowing these differences to stand out and transform into visible materiality as individuality. People who gather here with or without disability can coexist with one another as their true self. To create an environment where everyone can believe in their own potential and can make the most of their, of their abilities. Um, this was the message from the client, but um, we found it is very important thing that we should think when we think architecture. Uh, actually, this is original atelier. Some members are working together at a big table, and the other members have their own table to be alone, like this. And actually, he's a uh, staff who support uh, people with disabilities, but he's also an artist, and he's doing his own paintings here. And behind this wall, there is a storage, and a uh, person who really don't want to talk anybody, uh, there is a space for him to work, work alone. <laughs> so, um, hi. Hi. Uh, after seeing original atelier, uh, we make a first concept. Uh, it, we want to something like a forest. There, there are some uh, calm closed space and bright open space. Peop uh, each peop people can choose a comfortable place for themselves. And this is a model. And wall is a very uh, unique. Uh, I think this uh, wall system, uh, star wall pattern create walls and gaps at the same time, and in this system, system connection and separa separation is equal. Uh, with, within one space, uh, people can choose to be alone or be with one another. Uh, this is main uh, interior image. Uh, and this is narrow and space. Uh, and back is very bright and big spaces. Uh, this is big bright spaces, and we can see the uh, very nice corner uh, through through the space. Uh, this is a compression photo. You can see uh, many um, walls and stairs and windows and uh, roofs are gathered together in one space. And various activities are happening in one place at the same time. People feel that they have their own spaces and also they, they're they together. You can see, uh, sorry, a big table for the meeting and on the second floor there is a place to, to for parking, for parking and this is a craft space, and this is office space, and many people are doing different things, and but um, they are together. Hi. This is a cafe, and there is under eaves is open to the town, and it, it became a school route for elementary school students. This is a small shop. And also, I like, uh, we like this photo a lot because this is an office space and this is resting space. And a space where resting and working happen together. Gathering of walls are not only for divide, but also for connect several activities gently. 
Um, it is a place f to work, but sometimes uh, some artists come here to do some installation like this. This was an uh, art and music installation by uh, Art University at Good Job Center. This is um, from outside at, n at night time. Uh, second project is a new uh, central culture, a uh, new culture center in in Taga town, and we thought about landscape from landscape to architecture. This is the surrounding area. Um, in this project, we try to think about landscape and architecture, how to relate each other, create a new landscape in harmony with the environment using wood that has been uh, cut out from mountain behind. You can see a beautiful mountain here, and material comes from here to this building. Uh, this town located uh, near Kyoto. It takes two hours uh, from Kyoto by local train and bus. And in this town, 8,000 people live. And over, about over 85% is a forest. But uh, even though there's a lot of forest, but trees are left unused because of uh, limited demand, and so wood industry is not popular in this town. So we, through this project, we have to encourage the uh, lumber industry. Uh, this is a scenery, uh, how to deliver from the wood from, uh, uh, deliver from the forest. <laughs> and it took more than two years to prepare the all of the wood for project. And we have uh, uh, constraints about timber production. Uh, we have to consider the construction method, and there is a limit to the length of wood because of the trans transportation problem. And we cannot use uh, tim uh, laminated timber because the there is no plant uh, in the neighborhood. So maximum size of timber is limited. Uh, column, column length is maximum six meters, and beams maximum four meters. And so we propose a structure uh, sign, and uh, this is typical order of the timber structure. And this is a very simple idea. Uh, we create a long beam by connecting with a steel plate. And so this span is, maximum span is 10.8 meters. And, and uh, by making primary and secondary beams the same size, uh, we create a large and slim plate. So, oh, sorry. Uh, we can create a space in which thin roof plates are uh, floating like this. Uh, this is a space. This span is over 10 meters. And we have another uh, problem uh, about fireproof. Uh, Fireproofing and the fire compartment. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> A and B is a typical way of uh, solving this problem. A is wrap, wrapping everything with fireproof uh, materials, but we cannot see the timber. <laughs> so I had this option, and B is the inst install fire compartment wall, but uh, we refer to. Uh, traditional houses in nearby area, and we choose option C. Uh, this is a 
a drawing of traditional merchant house in nearby area. Uh, colored part is a warehouse, the fireproof by clay. And this is outside and this is inside the uh, house. And the fireproof warehouse surrounded around the main houses to protect them from external fire. And they also divide the main houses into several parts to prevent the spread of fire. So we, uh, it is like uh, that photo of traditional merchant's house. Actually, this is Maki's grand grandfather's house. <laughs> Uh, inside the photo, and this is a plan. Uh, total floor is two thousand uh, six hundred square meters. Uh, whole needs compartment by row. Uh, the other part, we installed uh, fireproof portions like this and divided several parts. So the the other parts can be imported exposed timber frame. Uh, this is a, a concept to how to make the space. Uh, let me shortcut. <laughs> okay. Hey. Uh, this is a, a com uh, compression photo. Uh, right, right side is a uh, space for kids, and this is a, a cultural center. And if people use the rooms, people have to pay a uh, small money. But uh, but common area is free, so we want to make uh, many places in the common area. Uh, benches, uh, Engawa-like space, and big table for kids. Uh, this is the main uh, entrance hall. We can see the sky through the gap of roof, and we can see the uh, light fields through the uh, kids' area. And this is a space for uh, library corner. And this table is very large and low and for kids. The kids gather this space to this space and studying. They can study. study. And I like this photo. Uh, several uh, roof plate overlap together. And I think through this project, uh, uh, technology and uh, wisdom can transform local constraint to attractive regional characteristics. <laughs> um, also, uh we made a lot of free papers and delivered them to all the houses in the town in order for people to know about the process of making architecture like this. We, um, we made 10 free papers during planning and construction period and delivered it all over the town. Oh. That's, um, why, that's why we, um, uh, we do that, because um, when I was a child, we thought um, public, ar public buildings are not loved by people. So um, we would like to change the situation. To, so we would like to share the process of making architecture by lo with local people and um, celebrate the architecture together. So this is the um, opening ceremony. We are preparing opening ceremony with local people together. So this is the opening ceremony. We had a big party and 
She's a lady uh, in local area, and she did um, she research a cooking, local cooking, cooking, and did a party. Um, many children helped us to help that party. And like this, um, this is very small town, and many old elderly and elderly people are living in this town, but many, many people came to the ceremony. So at last, um, we would like to show you some of our projects, because this talk is about technology. We would like to use technology to make uniqueness of the architecture. This is our first project we designed. Uh, this we went house. Uh, image is animal like roof in the forest, and technique is a bending steel plate. Uh, one steel plate cannot stand by itself, but supported each other. Uh, it will be the strong uh, structure. Uh, next is image is a floating cave uh, with uh, clay technique. Uh, this is a first compression project for uh, us. Uh, that is a folly in, uh, in the park. Uh, next is an animal-like bear hut in tempo. Uh, and technique is 3D carving wood. This is a one to five scale mock-up. And this uh, funny creature has two legs like this. So uh, if hung the big bear weight, uh, heavy bear, uh, he rotates. But this still rotates per. And this is cave in a dream. Uh, technique is a still rot and a click like this. And joint part is very interesting like this. And this is our latest project we have in Bangladesh. Uh, we are trying to make a, a factory for 600 people to work for making bags. And we are trying to talk with people in Bangladesh. And we are trying to think technology and diversity and individuality through this project. Thank you very much. I just want to mention my name is uh, Ben Reynolds. And, uh, I'm Valle Medina. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, it's uh, clearly a pleasure, as many people have said already, um, to be here and to also um, listen to the way in which other offices are um, negotiating um, contemporary questions that um, we hope also in our kind of brief talk about what we do, we, 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 um, we can let you know how we tackle them and how we, in fact, um, use the project as a means to comprehend um, this context. So we want to talk about uh, the way in which context shapes our practice um, and the role of the project as a strategy to comprehend. And here we're referring to the context in a broad sense. I should pick this up. Um, one that we're all exposed to and one that is in fact hard to articulate for us. Um, and more precisely, and perhaps this relates also to the panel that we've been um, assigned to, one that's becoming increasingly too complex even for um, human comprehension. So, okay. Um, in our practice, the question of comprehension uh, entails firstly acknowledging acknowledging a kind of surrender to the context, the kind of laying down of the arms of knowledge. This begins um, somewhat of a chaotic act of uh, shrugging off convention um, and our own pretense. So with every project, there is a, a kind of fatalistic act of, of the, the beginning moment of the project. So in the past, we've talked about um, this context as being somewhat of a, w w could be described as a noir con uh, context, something that we can sense dramatic things are happening, um, fed by massive shifts, I'm sure we are all aware of. 
um, but exactly what they are and how they shape the context, it's very difficult to claim. So um, in order to talk about our projects is to talk about long sequences of work and varying outputs um, and materials that are basically reasoning processes um, in order to comprehend. So in fact, we wrote a book uh, not so long ago, and we'll refer to it a little later, um, but it was inf inspired by this figure of Hugh uh, St. Victor, uh, the great mystical writer of the 12th century, you can see here on the left, a Parisian theologian who produced a, a document called the Mystic Ark, which is a non-existent document. It, it, it's only known um, by the, the, the whispers and the gossip of those who attended his lectures. Um, but effectively, it was a wall painting, so something at the architectural scale that contained at the time, at the 12th century, all the knowledge of the world. Um, things like the zodiac sign, the map, a map mundi, um, the zodiac cycles, as I said, and, and the entire cosmos. Uh, for him, the ark, um, and I quote, was to rid himself of, the conf of confusion, which is the mother of all ignorance. So again, this, this kind of brings us to the topic of technology in that um, every project begins as a kind of um, comprehension spur, a, a jolt, uh, which provides this initial vector of investigation. Um, and we begin um, by looking at this multitude of ways in which, we, uh, in which a subject can be addressed. The key for us is this massive survey, much like the work of, um, of Houston Victor. For example, we were commissioned by a private library in, in eastern Switzerland to work with a collection of 13,000 books. And obviously there's the, uh, the physical side of, of, a, of a library and its uh, arrangement, which is something we took into account. But also, um, we also had the, 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 the kind of ability to see with new eyes this entire collection in a very detailed way. And from that, we, we actually decided to find what could be called the kind of center of information of this place if we were to um, pass the information through, a, through a, a software that could read uh, locations of where the books were written and locations that were mentioned, effectively you could produce the center of the, uh, of the library, which we found to be um, approximately 480 kilometers off the coast of, of Greenland. Um, the poem, a poem could then be written by the titles of, of, of the content of this library. Um, and, and this poem, as you see sort of um, in this film that we made at the bottom of this image here, is essentially these places that the software thought were real, but in fact were, were not. So we passed this um, database through an information extraction pipeline, which actually has already built inside of it geography, names of places, names of rivers, names of mountains. And these were all places, in fact, that the algorithm thought were real, but it were indeed not. Um. Yeah, so following from this large act that we, yeah, we call like a, a, a structure act, we find that often the moment in which one can establish anything within complexity, within multitudes, uh, reveals that actually uh, nothing is established. So, but only a series of claims in motion could be, could be considered as something that is always moving and that actually informs the present. In order to form a sense with the ideas that we often work with, we find simply uh, clues that we unearth from motifs that often are contradicting, often come from very ancient times. Um, for example, in, in ancient Egypt, the heart used to be, uh, yeah, the belief was that the, uh, was the originator of thought. We still say that we memorize something by heart. Uh, not only did we discover that the mind is in fact the seat of intelligence, um, now the mind can fluidly print images in association to what it has experienced in the past. For example, on the left-hand side, uh, yeah, the brain can actually be exposed to footage. And then on the right-hand side, we can see how oops, uh, our memory can be reconstructing such a, such a sequence only from the images that 
has been storage biologically. Or for instance, for uh, when in the past uh, we tried to make sense of the sky, uh, of course, the differentiations in, in different levels of the atmosphere uh, were simply meant to be a, a perfect division between stratas are almost like levels of powers. Uh, nowadays, we know and we can have a different understanding where it's, we can perceive and we can compute uh, at an atomized level um, things like turbulence and laminar conditions, and actually the differentiating planes between them are simply different pressures and different, uh, different mathematical understandings of it. Indeed, the seas were thought to be made not simply of water of the river, but of the material found directly under the heaven, crystalline, conjured, especially combined to resist the flame of the sun, moon, and stars. It was an elusive kind of material. Now the seas are tiny pulses of wave energies, rolling and spreading data that are, that are at the same time simultaneously rerouting thousands of millions of, of vessels. So, um, so what we're effectively doing here is kind of comparing a, a knowledge at a particular moment in time um, that has been undermined and um, somehow critiqued by what we could call the contemporary condition. And it, it's also too with nature. You know, nature, as told by the Hudson River School not so far from here about 200 years ago, um, was considered immense, untamed, and, and something to be settled. Um, now, uh, Ooh. Now, um, our salads are actually, I guess, nascent beasts in the way that here cardiac tissue has been injected into um, a spinach leaf and is pulsating like, like a heart could. Um, obviously, in language, in a primitive sense, can be traced to an understanding of how nature sig signals itself. We always thought those signals to be honest. On the right, you see very clearly a, a, a yellow band frog clearly identifies its toxicity by its color. Um, but those signs also can be dishonest. On the left, this fiddler crab possesses a weak claw despite its size that still intimidates um, smaller species. Now, what is the future of language if words can be assigned, quote unquote, a poeticness? This is a project by the Kyoto uh, University wherein a machine can read an image um, and, and assign in, in its library words which it thinks it's, it's kind of poetic, things like singing, free, heaven, and so on, and create um, poems out of, of just looking at something. What does that actually mean for language? Um, and you know, Surely the poem of the future tries to avoid poeticness in general. Um, and again, if we keep comparing in deciphering the body, East, East Asians uh, understood it as a series of meridians. The body was not considered as something biological, but made of pathways along which energy flows. Now, among other things, um, the body is a space that can be read at a cellular level, whereby abnormalities and, uh, are recognized after matching samples against massive amounts of collected patterns. So, the line actually between a fake smile and a real smile <clears throat> has been for a long time <clears throat> excuse me, a subject of, uh, of study. Um, in some cases, we, we simply wear like a, like a fear green to tell our predators that we are harmless, that we are one of them. Uh, but now my, my smile is like my wallet, actually. Um, And even the tall and dark amalgam that we call the city was for the ancient Chinese uh, a cosmic diagram, an image that actually meant to balance a man, state, nature, heaven. It was designed to distribute she, the divine breath. Nowadays, the reality of the city, as we know, is that of, is that, is that of 
certain harboring of the known, the threat, and the potentials. So in all of these previous examples, it seems that the perception of reality changes always over time. What is considered a truth is made way for a heresy, which becomes truth, and so it continues. Uh, the idea that there is nothing established but only claims emotion means that there is an eternal crisis of definition. Already in the mid-60s, uh, Buckminster Fuller produces this document. It says knowledge had, had doubled every century up until the 18th century. By the end of the World War II, information was doubling every 25 years. Now, information is doubling every 30 months. The moment when every project becomes a sensor, we can say, uh, and also send, that it's also sending information out, we will lead to the doubling of information every 12 hours. So our practice has been for a while operating under this quest of amaz um, amassing information to create this, this sense and these intelligible ideas. Projects respond to a context that is becoming increasingly beyond the reach of our human comprehension, where information is at the begets of information itself. Uh, so what we do is very much architectural in nature, but this process often leads to exploration in different mediums and working with unique and independent collaborators. And our practice goes through, of course, an endless consolidation process, since we, we produce buildings, but we teach, and we produce books. For example, in the context of this particular project, um, yeah, the idea of an intense reconfiguration of what it meant to build in a context uh, foreign as China, uh, it, it, it is a project in itself. So out of this uh, complexity that we, we try to cut through this presentation, um, we discover that there are two archetypes within our, within our practice that are, are, the, are key to understand the way we, we articulate thinking. Um, the two figures are the fear of the conjurer and the, the fear of the seer. So um, on the wall of our studio in Basel um, is a gift given by a friend of ours, um, which is a, a reproduction of the painting uh, Card Shops by um, Caravaggio from 1594. And this friend cut out two details and framed them. Um, there are two faces, one of an unworldly boy, and the other is the card shop himself. Um, he said, or this friend of ours said that it was a reminder of um, that we forever slip between a state of unknowing and being able to author a manipulation over reality. Incidentally, this friend of ours is a marathon runner, and he said it's running for him is the only moment where he can become kind of characterless. So this became quite important in the beginning of our office um, to understand the problem of dealing with information, that it could be possible to be both someone in awe of complexity i.e. the state of unknowing, um, and someone that could manipulate it, uh, i.e. the conjurer, as I mentioned, which kind of reminds us of this also this particular interesting, I would call, almost call a kind of performance that Frank Lloyd Wright did um, during the construction of the Johnson Wax Building, where he was ordered by the Wisconsin um, Industrial Commission to prove whether his slender columns could withstand um, 12 tons. So what Wright did was he um, he said, OK, I will uh, take up your challenge, but also I will uh, invite the press. And so um, you know, one afternoon uh, on, in 1946, he, invite, um, he invited Mr. Johnson and the press, and after piling the column with sand for hours, it fell at 60 tons, which was five times the expectation. So here, somehow, Frank Lloyd Wright as the conjurer, where technical prowess meets the um, manipulator of truth. The second archetype, which is quite relevant for the studio, um, is the seer. The figure of the seer can really be traced back to, to Greek mythology, and it was known for being able to see things that are hidden from others. 
The SEER doesn't operate by foreseeing the future, but instead uh, operates by divination. Out of being able to comprehend reality, it makes something appear out of nowhere and operates by sacrificing information. Seeking knowledge of the future, we sign a pact very early on, as uh, could be considered like a funding document for the studio, that it reads, I climb high mountains um, to prepare my writing, which means, uh, <clears throat> in a way, it's, it's a, that is a remin reminiscence for us of, uh, of maintaining a certain sense of euphoria uh, in able to, to, to enable a, con a constant evolvement. Um, under constant recording as well, we constitute each of our individual annotation sheets or diaries. This large tabulae or of horizontal partitions is in principle algorithmic because of the vast information that, and variables that it can contain, but also of the type of operation that can perform. You could, for example, quickly construct an intersection between a thought annotated at 6 a.m. in a solitary room in New York City with a joke from 2005 annotated at 3 p.m. This is part of the method to organize what appears to be disjointed, random facets of, of existence. Um, so this figure of the conjurer and the seer plays a role in our, in our projects, but as well in our teaching. We are currently leading two pedagogical experiments. Uh, one is, in, is taking place in Vienna, which we, where we direct a design studio uh, for its theory department. And it's quite special about it is that um, it runs with, uh, with a philosopher, Vera Willmann, and a visionary and entrepreneur uh, operating under the pseudonym, like a fake name, uh, Don Gross. Um, in parallel, in London, we run a studio at the Royal College of Arts, uh, currently entitled Chronocopia. The studio runs as a pseudo corporation um, and is entitled High Holdings, where we encourage each of the individual um, participants to respond and be responsible for a certain domain of knowledge for them to, to evolve thinking. Um, in both uh, contexts, actually, um, we operate under certain freedoms uh, and also certain contractual operations. <clears throat> For example, what we call the free sheets, uh, which entitles each one of the students to, to actually produce thinking under, under restrictions. So the free sheet is actually a contractual um, limitation. Same with our own project. These two figures come together, for example, in the making of, uh, of the monograph Paris Hermitage. Um, the building came about uh, or originated from a performance. And here the architect can be seen carving a space and stepping away from the computer to re-engage with a sense of materiality. It documents the building Paris Hermitage, which is constituted by quartz articulations, and where citizens go there to restore their sense of, um, of work, or rest, wakefulness, from what we claim to be a current contempor contemporary condition of pulverization. It was published in late 2017 and was co-edited by New York publisher, uh, Nicholas Welteich. Um, yeah, and as a sum up, also the architectural response and the building was formed from masking 100 plans of of uh, educational spaces across history. Um, maybe just to finish, um, a second example of how a project for us is, a, is really a strategy of comprehension um, was an exhibition we produced um, for a gallery in Vienna um, in the form of sculptures and video works that became the seeds of, of a larger publication currently in the making. Um, 
The first move was to create a site-specific work, um, which is this fragment of a ceiling of a building called the Melgrube, which is a building that used to store on, uh, the, the, um, on one of the main plazas in Vienna the flower from all over Europe. It was a public building. Um, the work is made of uh, 300 kilograms of flour and comprised, um, and sorry, and composed from just reading a text about the building since um, no images or drawings of it exist. And in the same exhibition, we explore, explored the possibility of how to contain an atmosphere in an image. Um, this idea comes from the notion that everything between us and an object is mediated by a thick layer of air which distorts an image, i.e. that you know, everything is mediated by a state of turbulence. And this became the beginning of a project that puts um, the ideal geometry of an architectural rendering in question. And in doing so, can you measure this turbulence? Um, this is a capture of the movement of pixels across many uh, frames um, looking at the previous video. And so in order to inject an image, in, uh, sorry, an atmosphere inside of an image which we're currently working on, we built a device in the gallery which is called a, a scintillator which is um, a handmade uh, telescope and a source of heat, which is the candle you see on the left, which needs a precise alignment um, according to the focal length of the mirror. And in between that setup, um, we're, we've, we are placing uh, 35 millimeter slides of some renderings of uh, forthcoming projects. And out of this setup, which is, I guess, hot off the press, we're currently working on is a way in which you can document the recording of atmosphere or let's, let's say a kind of layer of reality on top of something as precise as an architectural image. And so to close, um, the project has become an excuse to um, comprehend context of increasingly massive amounts of information. And the role of this conjurer, or these two characters, the conjurer and the seer, is to adopt not just a method, but a character um, that produces a range of outputs. Typically, this only creates uh, more questions, uh, but above all, it produces a sense. And the origin of the word sense is, um, is direction. So thank you very much for your time. It's such a pleasure to see the work um, of you all and you know, this kind of wild grouping of technology. Mm -hmm. Um, but also that, um, you know, it's fantastic to have a window into the way that you think about your work and the way you produce your work, right? So this is opportunity and when we have this kind of grouping together, you start to think about the relationships. Um, so, you know, the pr your practices are so thoughtful and I also um, enjoyed, which I think others did too, seeing the studios. Mm -hmm. in which you're working, so you kind of help us understand the context, like kind of the local context and also the context of your thinking. So I just wanted to say a couple things um, before we open it up to questions to the audience, and one was that um, given this topic of technology, which is, of course, you know, and the, ubiqu the ubiquity of it and the context is that we could maybe all agree, or, may or not, I would say we might all agree that technology is not neutral, um, that it's not a neutral thing, and that um, was a question I wanted to ask you about, but um, maybe we'll open it up here too. Um, and that uh, material, because you all are working with this, uh, also I would say material materiality, whether it's the material information material, um, whether it's a particular material or whether it's this kind of context of materiality in a, a given place like mm -hmm. Amut. Um, so if we could also agree that material is not neutral um, and that I was thinking that one of the things uh, or some of the things that your all work is dealing with also is context, whether it's the context of thinking of knowledge um, or information in this very broad context or the context of the forest and the wood in which you're working in a very precise way with that material only um, or the context with which you guys are working where you began to assemble those photographs mm -hmm. and thinking about how this um, kind of local architecture um, and how you're putting those two things together and exposing a kind of seam mm -hmm. often, the seam, it's this materiality of the seam and maybe the seam is also something that you're all working with. So 
Um, I just wanted to say those few things, but I also to think about a context for speaking about the work here, and I want to open it up because I know we're seriously over a schedule, and you guys have all been sitting for a long time <laughs> before eating. So, um, if there are questions, uh, you're positioned as <laughs> representatives of technology as architects, and how you respond to the capacity of uh, I guess technology or knowledge to both clarify thought and clarify intent, and also obfusc obfuscate that and confuse that by its uh, by the burden uh, and kind of overwhelming nature of data and knowledge at the moment. Um, how do you how does your practices operate between that spectrum of um, overabundance of knowledge and technology and data and clarification of it? give her a quite short thought to that. Um, well, at least uh, I could say that for us, the te technology is not an end on itself. So we really like to work with uh, these tools in order to be able to, to articulate r rather complicated scenarios. And I would say it's also like a, like a gate <coughs> to see more things mm -hmm. rather than the, the opposite. I don't know that that would maybe answer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in, in our case, technology is always quite hands-on, used in a very direct relation to the project. So if we have, you always, for us, it's a challenge <laughs> to to also challenge the technology in a certain way that to go beyond the standard. Um, usually there's always a standard which is um, applied in building construction. And how do you challenge this, um, the way technology is used? Um, and to, you can see this in different, in all the three projects, in sometimes details, like the coroner details, but also in the use of material and um, also the misuse of materials sometimes. I don't know. Oh, please, 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 please. And um, I think there, I think there are uh, obviously several aspects of technology. The one is that you can use it for perhaps have more possibilities in the building process, which is quite interesting. For example, the prefabricated wooden constructions, you have more, also kind of more freedom than in uh, other systems, perhaps. And this is also not easy to handle that, because then you have to find other reasons why you're doing something in a certain way. And the other thing is that we all in for the sustainable buildings, in Germany at least, we have a lot of technology to build in the, in the uh, buildings. And we are now trying to reduce all these technology. It's not really important to the building as um, in design aspects because you mostly you don't see these things but you have to handle it and, the, it and it rises up the costs enormously which is really kind of bad and you always have to kind of repair these things and after a few years you are recognizing that that doesn't really work properly and things like that and so now we try to make some a building for example where we kind of um, handle it in a completely different way and try to really reduce it and make l low, uh, low technology buildings. So, like no ventilation, no heating system, or just a very mm. simple heating system. Um, with Things like that. Um, so, Be because there's not hi no hydraulic system anymore. Mm. Um, so, just um, how how basic can you go um, using as at, as least as much technology as possible. Because after 10 years or 15 years of monitoring all these systems, um, it became a little bit obvious that it doesn't work like the kind of numbers are. It's just a kind of a calculation, but it doesn't match with the reality. <laughs> Andres, did you? Yeah. Well, thank you. The, the talks were really amazing, and uh, they opened many questions. Uh, one of them, and I, I'd like to ask specifically to Amon, uh, because you had this reference to a number of uh, books that have been very important, 
Rudovsky, of course, architecture without architects, or the Behar's work at large, or made in Tokyo, in which basically the relationship of practices with technology was very different in the way it was perceived through those uh, studies. Uh, the first, uh, also, Behar was very much about a technology in which designers, engineers, or developers were very much hands-on in the development of components, uh, uh, systems, uh, whereas, for instance, Made in Tokyo is much more opportunistic. It's technology that was de developed by others and was mobilized uh, through a series of, of, from a position in which basically designers were not that much uh, developing those components, and Rudovsky was talking of something different. Like, but my question is basically, what is the, 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 the way you think as practitioners, you have the possibility of uh, relate to industry or to the uh, processes by which components, systems are developed, not only, let's say, applied? Well, uh, um, these, these references or these books are maybe, they were also a little bit misleading because they are more references or models for our um, aim of observation. So I can understand that technology-wise, it's a to totally different path. So, um, but we still, like, um, like Rudowski, he's, he's focusing on this simple construction, um, like the Let's, let's call it more authorless architecture, not, not architecture without architect. Um, but it's, it's, in Germany we are really, it's a very uh, advanced building market, so technology is something which is massively sold, and so we try to reduce it more, or it's uh, our aim in our project is to reduce this enormous <coughs> technology amount, um, so because the experience is that um, you don't build, uh, you don't make better architecture by <coughs> incorporating more and more technology. So it, it's uh, just in some very specific corners and um, construction elements we use advanced technology like the prefabrication or uh, the misuse of material, but like all these heating systems and all this technology is not something that we are very interested in. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting as well, <coughs> following from this notion of uh, the building systems, uh, the idea that technology is there, we can use it, we can apply it, but for us, as, at least uh, as a thought, the idea of uh, almost challenging the idea of this, of comfortability, as mm -hmm. you, were, you were mentioning before, that maybe uh, you're thinking nowadays of uh, conceiving a space that has no, no heating maybe or mm -hmm. no ventilation system. Mm -hmm. um, that for me is very interesting to, to see. Yeah, to somehow um, find this sort of themes you know, mm -hmm. where uh, the idea of comfortability or the idea of the convention can be maybe challenged or yeah, mm -hmm. reconfigured. I might also just add, if I can. Sure, um, please. Yeah, I think it's interesting also um, teaching, which I, I guess, in, you know, by, by, um, by teaching you kind of come into contact with a kind of emerging generation who have no pretense about what the point of using technology is. It's not really even a question. It's somehow mm -hmm. some, something natural. And, uh, you know, it's interesting also to look at the way in which architecture's relationship to technology not just in, in, in how an, a building comes about, but also the forms which have kind of generated, uh, you know, with respect to say certain kinds of software. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess for us this, what, what we kind of term a sort of naturalizing process with respect to technology, obviously these things are somehow polar opposites, nature and technology, but nevertheless deciding when and how to use something and, and um, almost res respective of understanding what architecture does with technology, that if, you c if we could make decisions based on what is, what, what is the most effective way we can use technology in one point, or um, yeah, how, how can a certain output using technology be relevant you know, at a s for the certain thing that you need to achieve. It's, I guess it sounds kind of abstract, but um, 
But, I, but somehow, given, given the fact that architect, uh, technology is such a given, um, then I think everything's in question as well, right. you know? Right. The, I was thinking that also, I mean, in all of your work, or this, so the question of this, the dialectic or this kind of opposition mm. all mm. comes up in your work, but the um, also constraints in which, whether it's, you know, this, you said um, a comprehension spur where you're, you're kind mm. of trying to gather all this information as a way to spur ideas, mm. but um, the free sheets that you used mm -hmm. in the studio mm -hmm. or the constraint of just using the one material or just this question of how do I resolve a connection, right? Mm -hmm. And not even talking about the rules, all this, these rules that came up last with um, David's um, discussion about sustainability or the kind of constraints, the governmental constraints that you're referring mm -hmm. to in, in sustainability. So, I mean, so the, this topic here of technology, which seems, we, you know, we kind of think we know it, but actually, I think what you guys are exposing, I think, to me or to us, is this other side of it that it's, when you say it's more natural or not the ubiqu ubiquity of it, but a kind of mm -hmm. um, given that you're undermining in another way. So, anyway, mm -hmm. thank you. And thank you guys. Thank you.